This is firefighter Raphael Poirier for Firehouse Subs. Introducing the new spicy Cajun chicken sub, Cajun seasoned grilled chicken breast, zesty cherry peppers, and house-made Cajun mayo. Just $5.55 for a medium. Remember, a portion of every sub you buy helps provide life-saving equipment for first responders. Firehouse Subs. Enjoy more subs. Save more lives. Limited time only, plus tax. Participating locations. Firehouse Subs would donate a minimum of $1 million in 2019 to the Firehouse Subs Public Safety Foundation by donating 0.11% of every purchase. Here we go. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Source Material Podcast. We're coming at you with episode 206. And this evening, uh, we are tying this in. I don't have Mark Rattlish to throw to here when I usually uh, are like, hey, why, why the heck are we doing this book? So I kind of got to take up slack here. This evening, we're covering a book, tying it in with the TV party tonight that we're going to be doing on season two of The Runaways, which I think is still on free form. This book we're doing, this was, it's kind of took me by surprise because Mark goes in, and usually what he does is he grabs a book that is somewhat related to what's going to be going on in the, in the season. Now, the last time we covered The Runaways, when we did season one, we covered, I think, volume one issues like one through eight, I think. It, was, it, was, it, was, it wasn't as many as this because Mark Radlich came back with a vengeance on this one and said, hey, let's do volume two and let's do all of the first 18 issues from the 2005 series. And I'm like, wow, okay, there's been times and you can count them on one hand that the Source Material podcast has covered over 10 issues in one spot. And 18 issues may actually be the record because I did <laughs> Maximum Carnage. And that about, oh my goodness, that was early on in my podcasting career where I was like, hey, we've got to really dive into this and do two, three hour epic podcasts about it. Negative, negatory. That's not happening here tonight. We're, we are going to be covering these pretty quickly. We're just going to gonna go through each story that's laid out through all 18 issues of volume two of Runaways. Just speak on whatever the, yep, there they are. Wait, which one was that, Alexis? That was Eddie. Eddie. That was the corgi. <laughs> So Alexis Haina has joined us tonight, helping us out here this evening. Chris Armstrong, are you ready to talk about some Runaways, man? You cram these books in, dude. You've been cramming like what? You started from Volume One, uh, the the two thousand was it the two thousand three series, and then just kept reading. Uh, yeah, I mean it hadn't <clears throat> it had been uh, you know over a decade since I read any of these, uh, and I figured I had enough lead time I could I could uh, get through all of it, but uh, <laughs> I had a lot of stuff. I, I was actually. I had a pinched nerve in my neck that I was dealing with for like a week, and then I, oh. I got kind of under the weather after that. Once that healed, I was thought I was coming down with the flu, but it turned out to be just like a 24-hour thing. Uh, and then I had a death in the family, so it's been a really hectic two weeks. So I didn't quite didn't quite make it. Well, I, that's completely understandable, man. Like I said, 18 issues is a, a hefty amount. So what we'll do tonight is I'm I'm forgoing the synopsis. I'll do all that post edit. So we will we will be just fine. We'll kind of bring up the stories, maybe talk about some of the important things that happened and some of the things that spoke to you guys. Let's go ahead and do this. Let's talk about the runaways because if you're tuning in for the first time, you may not know who the runaways are. Uh, and this book was written by a very one of my favorite writers, Brian K. Vaughn. Brian K. Vaughn has wrote uh, quite a few things that I've really enjoyed. Runaways being one of them. Uh, we did why the last man like within my first year uh, of doing the podcast i think we talked like maybe the first eight issues of that really enjoyed that and of course he also has his hands in one of my favorite television series of all time and that's lost but also saga uh, we did a discussion on saga within i think it was about sometime last year i believe where we again it was like volume one of saga and it was written so compelling that we wanted to continue to cover that and why the last man the intention was to continue on reading that and doing a podcast soon after it of course things get in the way other topics come up and that's kind of right. where we where we left things off but brian cave on and then on again this is 2005 the second volume of runaways uh, we're going to see a couple artists that show up here mainly it's adrian alfona i think is uh alfana alfona uh doing pencils and at one point there is a miyazawa 
Oh boy, I should pull that Kikishi up. Miyazawa. I'm not sure how that's right, but I think that's what it is. We're going to roll with that because that uh, <laughs> sounds right to me. Uh, he or she did pencils on Starcross, which was just a couple issues, but it's definitely different from Alphonus pencils, and you can tell uh, mm-hmm. it, lo- it it looks definitely more animated, but uh, or anime, I should say. Uh, so, yep. All right. So there's your creative team. But let's talk about the Runaways. Chris, if I were to pitch it to you, do you think you could give us an idea of this iteration of the Runaways that we have in these first few issues? Yeah, well, it's a smaller team, I guess, than in the first volume because Alex is gone. So we've got Chase, the uh, not-so-bright, kind of almost like a jock, sole male member of the team. Molly, uh, who is probably my favorite Runaway, or or one of, or definitely one of the top two or three, an eleven or twelve year old mutant that uh, has <clears throat> super strength in limited quantities. Uh, she gets tired really easily. Nico Minora, who <clears throat> has a magic staff and magic based powers, and she's kind of the leader of the group. Who kind of took the, the initial leader? Of course, was Alex, uh, who kind of betrayed the team in Volume One and uh, faced fiery wrath for it. Mm-hmm. Um, so Nico is kind of the leader now, and then um, Gertrude, who has a pet psychic Velociraptor. I'm blanking on Caroline. Caroline, the yeah, dear. yeah, uh, who is an alien with like light based, energy based uh, powers. And they're kind of living on their own because they don't trust adults or authority figures of any kind, which a lot of teenagers can relate to. (laughs) Yeah, their parents were villains. They were super villains uh, in a pact of villainy called the Pride. Uh, And that was pretty much where volume one all took place was there. Them dealing with the fact that their parents were super villains. And when they witnessed some kind of I think it was a horrific like event uh, that they were like they were sacrificing people, I think, if I remember correctly. And uh, so they took off. They left. They ran away from their parents. They had a big run in with their parents in volume one. And then volume two. Yeah, that's who we got left. We've got Gert. We've got Chase. We've got we're going to go now. We're going to probably go down the pronunciation bridge. (laughs) Carolina. Everybody hold hands as we cross the pronunciation bridge. I want, I'm going with Carolina it's here. Gonna, it's going to be rough for me, too. <laughs> it doesn't make any easier. She goes by the moniker Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. That's, that's right. <laughs> yes. Now I can pronounce that. Um, and then, uh, yeah, uh, Nico. Nico. So... Yeah, so there's our band of runaways. And so we we run into the first six issues, which is True Believers. True Believers, issues one through six, written by Brian K. Vaughn and pencils by Adrian Alfona. When a time travel machine appears in the runaways hideout carrying a dying adult Gert, it is revealed to the team that a young child named Victor is destined to become a villain that kills a future incarnation of the Avengers. And it falls to our runaways to stop this from happening. After finding Victor a seemingly innocent high schooler, they now have to make a decision on what to do with him, especially since Victor's powers manifest for the first time in their first encounter. To add to the drama, an outreach group of teenage superheroes assembled by former New Warrior Turbo and former Green Goblin Phil Urich called Excelsior has been put in action by a mysterious benefactor to bring the runaways in. This group consists of Johnny, Ricochet, Chris Powell, Darkhawk, Julie Power of Power Pack, and Jono, also known as Chamber. Their first confrontation with the Runaways does not go so well, and the Runaways escape with Victor. Talking with Victor, the Runaways explain what he is destined to become. Victor attempts to figure out if what they are saying is true, and it is soon revealed that he is an android built by his mother with the help of Ultron. Confronting Ultron, the team is nearly defeated when Excelsior shows up and helps them out. During the battle, the Runaways escape again. At the end of the story, Excelsior is attempting to regroup when one of the members has disappeared. It turns out Chamber was not who he said he was, after all, and seems to have been someone in disguise working with a group that may be related to the Pride. So big, big events happen in these first six issues. So uh, Alexis, we'll start with you. What do you think of the first six issues? I will say this, that I do love uh, Brian K. Vaughn's ability to write a good fight scene. I love this first fight scene with the Wrecking Crew, just how they slowly reveal their powers. I love when he corners Gert and she's like, oh, by the way, look up. And there's a freaking Velociraptor in the tree. (laughs) 
I really like that. It's corny, it's cheesy, but oh my god, it's so much fun. Have you read much Brian K. Vaughn going into this? Not too much. Uh, okay. I, I have been a fan of The Runaways for a while now. It's actually kind of funny. I got into The Runaways because, again, I'm a, I'm a professional Comic-Con vendor, and when I first got started in, my well, my signature look, the way I look, if you guys see me on the street, I frequently wear arm warmers and my hair is always color different colors. <laughs> so I had a lot of people thinking I was cosplaying as Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. And I people was like, so you're Lucy? And I'm like, well, that's my favorite Beatles song, but what the hell? <laughs> <laughs> and I looked it up like, why do people do? Oh, okay, that explains it. So that's how I actually go. I was like, so who's this character or what says? I'm pretending to be. <laughs> you're, you're right. He can he can write uh, some neat interactions between characters as well. Uh, you know, they show up to try and get that kid away from his grandpa. Like, I don't know what these these uh, the runaways were thinking at this point in time. This this uh, kid who was with the wrecking crew was rather willingly there and helping out his grandpa rob this place. Uh, and at, by the he, end of that his fight. Dad. He it was, was his dad. His dad. He, they were saying we, we want to return him to his grandparents. Oh, okay, all right. And the kid's like also totally willing to murder a young girl with a shovel. <laughs> yeah, they did too. Broke it right off her head. But yeah, yeah. And and by the end of that, you know, they were just like, okay, well, we don't we don't necessarily want this kid in here because they had, again were feeling the betrayal uh, from Alex. And they didn't want some to bring somebody into the fold that could would probably just end up doing the same thing. Who's gravitating towards villainy already? Chris, <laughs> tell us about Excelsior. Oh boy, you know, I mean, I, I we've already kind of had, I've had a, a few statements on this the uh, treatment of one of my favorite characters in this book earlier in our group chat, but I was I was kind of being over dramatic. You know, the Runaways are based in L.A. Mm -hmm. uh, unlike almost every other Marvel book, Marvel character, which is New York, almost always New York based. So the Runaways are about the only superhumans who show up in L.A. at the beginning. But once they defeat their parents and the pride is no longer kind of running things on the West Coast, other you know, supervillains hear that and they, they start to kind of make their way. They think no superheroes, they can make their way over there. <clears throat> and so that leads to a lot of, of the, the interactions the Runaways have with villains and stuff. Mm. But it also... It also uh, brings the uh, Excelsior group to L.A., which is a group of former, like, teen superheroes, new warriors types who have <clears throat> decided that that was a really uh, harmful uh, way to be brought up, you know, in the superhero community, you know, risking your life and stuff like that, which is comprised of former new warrior Turbo, Chamber of the Generation X. Oh, yeah. Uh, the, who, who's the power pack? Julie Power, which I, boy, I don't know much don't about know the much power, power pack. pack. Yeah, yeah, she was the youngest, I believe. Okay. Uh, that That's really all I know about her. And then Ricochet, who was a slinger, uh, part of the Identity Crisis Spider-Man mini event that happened in the late 90s that kind of resulted in a team called the Slingers, and Ricochet was one of them. And uh, then, of course, Darkhawk. Oh, boy. Um, who pretty much since he, his inception in, uh, I think, 91, which is right around the time I started getting into comics, um, he's been my favorite character. Um, you know, when people ask me who my favorite comic book character is, I usually just say Captain America because everybody knows who that is. Even before <laughs> the movies, he was already pretty ingrained in, like, pop culture. Oh, yeah. But if I say Darkhawk, it's like, who? <laughs> so I'm a big fan of Captain America, but but uh, really Darkhawk's been my favorite character for like since at the beginning, since he, since he was introduced. I was just saying, I'll, I'll go ahead and confess when the, when they're going around <laughs> introducing who they are, I had really no clue who any of these teams were. I I guess I missed that part of the Marvel comics. I, I hadn't really heard of many of these teams. I just knew that the way Julie Power talked about herself, I just wanted to punch her in the face. <laughs> <laughs> She's an aspiring actress. Come on now. Let's network. Really? I mean, Julie Power is probably the most, would be the most well-known of these characters anyway. Or Chamber, because he was, you know, part of an X-Men team. Yeah. Um, but, like, Ricochet, he had probably appeared in, like, you know, 12 books. Because that Slinger's book only lasted, like, 12 issues. So he had probably been in, like, 12 to 15 comics ever before this. You know, Turbo was in the New Warriors, but she wasn't one of the famous members. She wasn't in a ton of those books, so. Yeah, and, and we, uh, I don't know if we brought this up or not, but Phil, Phil Urich, which I, yeah. I think, is yeah. that Ben's nephew? 
I, I can't remember yes. how he's related. Obviously, he's related to Ben somehow. But yeah, I'm pretty sure he's his nephew, and he was the quote unquote heroic Green Goblin. In yeah, the late, so he had a series of his own for about a year. He ends up just recently. Well, I say recently, probably within the last, oh, I don't know, six, five or six years, I think, maybe a little bit more than that. But mm-hmm. he he had come back as a Spider-Man villain. Yeah, he uh, played a pretty big part in the last Dan Slott uh, storyline for that Spider-Man. That's right. Goblin King, the Goblin yeah. King. You know and, what I said about Darkhawk earlier in the group chat? I really do kind of feel that way about the way they used <laughs> Phil Urich, uh, Dan Slott used Phil Urich, because I kind of liked that character. And he basically just kind of ruined him but i don't have that much of an emotional attachment to him i guess tell us about dark hawk because i don't know much i i I remember him clearly being on the front of a lot of 90s comics (laughs) and and you know guest appearances whatever but i i don't know much about his power set or what he i know he's tied to whatever that crystal is or or something to lay it on me here what what are we talking about amulet thank you (laughs) yeah he um he was kind of like the Spider-Man for the 90s. They, that He was a teenager, you know, and they kind of wanted to give him that every kid tap into that, which is probably why I was a big fan of his. I was only 11, but still. he Basically, his dad was a cop, and uh, he had a couple of younger brothers, and he stumbled on this amulet in, like, an abandoned amusement park. <clears throat> and when he found it, he actually was looking for his dad, who he caught, like, doing a um like a shady drug deal like he found it his his dad was a cop on the take mm-hmm. and uh, and then he finds this amulet saves his brother's lives because there was a big conflict i don't want to get into too much of the details but basically he found this amulet and uh, it gave him these powers whenever he kind of willed that he would transform from a normal teenager into this you know souped up androids type body uh, okay he had a claw cable that would shoot out. It was kind of like Wolverine's claw. I mean, he was they were te- they were taken liberally from other more popular characters. Like his claw cable really looked like Wolverine's claws and uh, stuff like this. But yeah, his series lasted like fifty issues before it got canceled uh, in the late nineties. And then he was never really you never really saw much of him again until this uh, Runaway storyline. So. You want to talk about why you dislike Brian K. Vaughn's take <laughs> I, on I, Dark Hawk? I really, I really don't dislike it. I did kind of like that um, in these issues, Dark Hawk really develops like an anger issue. Yes. Um, I thought they leaned a little too much into it. Like when he was, you know, blasting, I can't remember her name, but the Turbo character, like just blasting her across the room because she'd put her hands on him. And when he picked up Ricochet by the throat, like in a super threatening manner, I thought they were going a little too far. But I did like that Vaughn brought in this aspect that, like, as he was getting older, the uh, weight of using the amulet was taking its toll on him mentally and stuff like that. That was interesting. Mm. Um, I really legitimately do hate some of the stuff they've done with Darkhawk since this uh, storyline. They basically retconned a lot of his stuff in the more recent Darkhawk books. He had a War of Kings uh, miniseries and some other stuff, but... I but yeah, I, did, I, I was happy to see him in this book. It was cool to see one of my favorite characters that was kind of long forgotten brought back for this. And also, he kicked Ultron's ass. So <laughs> I can he did too. Dark Hawk beat the shit out of Ultron. <laughs> <laughs> he did. Alexis, what do you think of uh, Victor Mancha here? This this teenager that has no idea what the future holds for him. What do you think of that character? I like that they kept you guessing on how he actually fit into the picture. I loved the reveal between Dr. Doom's Doombot. I don't know why, but I always get excited whenever they reveal it's a Doombot. It's just one of the <laughs> ultimate cliches that I laugh so hard at every single time. It's like, of course it is. Yeah. But I did love Ultron's reveal. I like that scene where he's talking to him telepathically. He's like, I'm not going to do what you're, you want me to do. And he's like, you've been doing it for five minutes. We're talking in your head. <laughs> it's very reminiscent of like the, uh, the scene in Alan Moore's Watchmen where Ozymandias is like, uh, you, it's like, you really think I would risk you having a chance to fight back? Yeah. yeah. I, I, I don't know. I like that writing. That was really good. If you listen to any previous episodes, you know, I'm a big fan of time travel. I'm definitely a big fan of bringing this possible betrayal uh, from the future to the past. And the runaways go and, you know, they confront that head on by immediately going to try and find Victor and they find him and then they make him a member of the team. 
there's that. Just like you said, there's just a. Did they they keep you guessing? Number one, okay, who's the father? This is a bad episode of Maury Povich or whatever. Um, but we find out that obviously Doom was not the father. It was Ultron, and Ultron had created Victor and gave him all these memories, and with the intent of shoving him into the Avengers at some point, the 99 percent chance that he would become an Avenger, uh, <laughs> so he could turn around and and uh, get his revenge within the team. And it worked in one possible future anyway. Yes, it did. It did. And then, and so that leads my next question for Alexis here. Do you trust Victor? Kind of hard to say. We have seen the idea that there can be multiple timelines, multiple realities. Mm -hmm. So it's not out of the realm of possibility, but we're also familiar with the content of things we've seen in days of future past where a character can be framed like what happens uh, like the in days of future past. Wow. It did not frame that well. (laughs) (laughs) Did you continue to read this series there, Chris? Is he uh, all the way to its completion there uh, back when back, you know, back when it was coming out? Or Well, I was um, I wasn't on board when the series first started. I picked up one of those digest style volumes uh, at a con because I'd heard how good it was. Mm-hmm. Uh, and because I'm a nerd, I was like, well, I've just got to get them all in the digest versions now. So <laughs> it will all look <laughs> nice on my shelf. So I did continue reading it in trade form uh, as the digest were coming out up until around the time Terry Moore and Humberto Ramos uh, were working on it, um, which is probably maybe another two years past this, this volume. I know uh, Whedon did the next run briefly. And then I think Moore and Ramos did some, some runs after that. I, I kind of lost track in that range, but I did like the book uh, still. It just wasn't quite the same after Brian K. Vaughn was off of it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, jumping back to Victor real quick. I mean, uh, just to let everybody know, you know, this is a character who they come back. They say, hey, you're going to be the big evil that kills the Avengers in the future. And we got to figure out who your dad is. And when they first confront him, I mean, he's his powers show up for the first time of his entire life, at least according to him. You know, that they they just show up and he doesn't understand what's going on. He's got these like weird metal manipulation slash electrical type powers. Uh, but uh, again, like I said, they make him a part of the team. And there's clearly some issues with, OK, do we trust this guy or do we not? We just watched one of our members come back in time and die in front of us saying that this guy was going to be the big bad uh, in the future. So I also like the fact that um, the Excelsior group, who would later get their own miniseries called The Loners, just FYI. Um, I, did, I saw that they became The Loners. I didn't know they got a series, though. That's, yeah, I that's think it was just like a five or six issue series. And that was pretty much it, I think. And I think, as I recall, like each issue focused on a on a different character from the group. It wasn't. I didn't think it was uh, that great, honestly. But they did have a series. Um, but I liked that once you know Ultron showed up, the kids pretty much quickly realized right away, like we're way out of our league. <laughs> the Excelsior group pretty much won that fight for them because uh, yeah. the Runaways themselves. I mean, they they have powers, but they're just kids, and their power sets aren't really all that advanced compared to, to some of the other superheroes that run around in the Marvel universe. Um, so I thought that was kind of like a dose of reality for the, for the runaways group, like that, how, how dangerous this, that lifestyle is. Yeah, absolutely. The big cliffhanger we are kind of left on there was like one of the, one of the groups, or excuse me, one of the members of Excelsior uh, was not actually who they claimed to be, which ended up being uh, Jono or Chamber. Uh, yeah. And that's that was the the big cliffhanger is at the end. I think at the end of those issues, they're looking for Jono. Jono's gone, and you see Jono walk into this this room, and all you can see all you can see is basically all these people's torsos, and you realize that there's something going on with the pride again. And that's kind of where we leave that. Starcrossed issues seven and eight, written by Brian K. Vaughn, pencils by Takeshi Miyazawa. The beginning of Starcross finds our team battling the B-list villain Swarm. See what I did there? Victor proves to the team that he has good intentions, as he is the sole one who is able to take Swarm down. Afterwards, the kids decide to go shopping. Carolina makes a pass at Nico, but Nico rejects her. Soon after, a super scroll by the name of Zavin appears, explaining that Carolina is destined to be their bride. After a short scuffle, the team speak with Zavin, and he explains Carolina is an important part of bringing two warring cultures together by marrying them. After some deliberation, Carolina decides to leave the team and go with Zavin to outer space, leaving the runaways with one less member.
Uh, so, Alexis, we'll start with you again. What would you think of uh, these couple issues? I, I did like these a lot. Um, like I said, Caroline's one of my favorite characters. I don't know why. I just love Chase's reaction when he finds out that she's gay. Because everyone else is like, you seriously couldn't figure this out. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of like, uh, yeah. We, You know, what was funny was at, when we did our first review, th- that was hinted to, I think, in that in that first volume. It wasn't as overt as we get here because Carolina makes a pass at Nico. And, and Nico's very like, oh, wait a second. <laughs> but yeah, that's kind of hinted to at the beginning uh, of the very first volume, if I remember correct. Uh, but yeah, so even the reader knew at that point, we're volume two in here. Yeah, everybody knew kind of what was going to happen. Uh, but yeah, yeah go- in rereading this, you know, for the first time in for, forever, obviously I knew that that was coming. And it was yeah. like, you can see the hints like he laid that out pretty much from the beginning, but it's it wasn't so obvious that you would know no. what was going on. It was right. kind of hinted at over and over until the reveal. That's right. I just like the idea that the scrolls, when she basically, the scroll takes a, uh, how do you, how do you pronounce the name? Zavin? I'm going to go Zavin, Zavin, whichever one you want to go with. He's an alien, so I don't really yeah. care. <laughs> I, I know we joke about the pronunciation bridge, but I think this is the point where we jump off of it. <laughs> yeah. But I love that she says, you know, sorry, you know, he takes the form of a boy and she says, well, I'm, I like girls. And Zayvon's just like, okay. I just, <laughs> immediately the form. She's like, whatever, click. That kind of took me by surprise too. I forgot that the dude was a super scroll and could change form. I was right. like, oh, well, crap. You know, I guess he's got a point. He, she's got mm-hmm. a point. It's got a point. Did you think, Alexis, that Carolina left just way too easily? Yes and no. It was obvious that this was a major plot point and that she was going to come back at a pivotal moment. It it was a little contrived, but I could see why they made it work. What do you think of the art? Miyazawa? Miyazawa. Uh, was it a welcome change or did you notice a big difference or what do you think? I hate to say it. I'm actually trying to flash forward or go back through the issue because I do not remember the art. Oh, there it is. Yeah, it was a it was a little different, but I kind of liked it. Uh, it's very reminiscent of what we probably would see with the uh, the Timiverse, something like out of Teen Titan, the classic Teen Titan. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay. All right, Chris, what do you think of Starcrossed? Uh, yeah, in regards to the the art change, which he had done some issues, I think in Volume One as well. I really like Miyazawa's art. I think that he does a great job. Like the, they look like kids. Yes. More so than I think when Alfina, I think, um, which I, I, to be fair, I like the art a lot. I like both of the art, uh, artists a lot. Um, I think Alfina's got a kind of an oddball look, almost kind of like uh, Nick Patera. I think that's his name that does Manhattan Projects. Um, but I like the the, uh, the kind of faux anime style. I think it works really well for the Runaways. They, they are very different, so it's kind of jarring going from one to the next. But I, I like the art both ways. Um, and I, I, I like these two issues. Um, it was cool to see Swarm. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, who... I really only remember from an issue, a couple issues of Sensational Spider-Man back in the day, I, and I, I think he's popped up in a few other places, kind of like this, just to be a ridiculous villain. Uh, mm-hmm. So it's always a nice bonus, I think, when he shows up. I did think that the Carolina jumping in the ship with with uh, her fiance was a little bit of a quick turn. I realize it's a comic book; you got to kind of move things along. Yeah, uh, but like he really didn't. They really just took him at his word. It just seemed kind of odd that you'd like, okay, I'll go. Yeah, I mean, he comes uh, there. He's, he's spinning this they, big story about how, oh yeah, we have t- we have the scrolls and these other people are at war, and if I could bring you back and you're on my side, then we can maybe unite this and end this right. war. And it's like, and it, it's a good Good, it's a good like I mean I like the the idea there it's just and they didn't really nobody even really stood up and was like hey we don't know if he's telling the truth yeah they all just kind of everybody just kind of accepted it you know Nico didn't want her to go obviously but but yeah. it wasn't because she was like mistrusting or anything like that but it just was odd looking back at it actually I did flip back through it a little bit more there is a subtext to it when she gives her bracelet back and says it's the thing I use to hide my powers I don't have to mm-hmm. pretend to be something I'm not anymore there's a real subtext to that both the fact that Carolina is the only uh, homosexual member of the team but the fact that yeah when she's around unless they're fighting she has to hide her powers I think that right. she is I think she's tempted with the fact that she can finally be who she is both an alien and gay. Mm-hmm. <laughs> 
East Coast, West Coast, issues 9 through 12. Brian K. Vaughn still the writer. Adrian Alfona is back for pencils. Dagger of Cloak and Dagger is in the hospital, and Cloak is believed to be the person who had savagely beaten her and put her there. Escaping Captain America, Luke Cage, and Spider Woman, Cloak remembers the runaways and asks them for help to go and find the imposter that took his form and did this to Dagger. The runaways agree and run into various superheroes and villains while trying to solve the mystery. Finally, it is revealed the culprit is a nurse who used some mutant growth hormone, mimicking Cloak's abilities he had bought from the, the Pusher Man. The runaways save the day, but behind the scenes, the group that may be the pride are still plotting against them. All right. East Coast, West Coast. Issues 9 through 12 here. So, uh, Alexis, we'll start with you again. I mean, you got anything you'd like to say about uh, this this particular, what is this, five issues, four issue story here? Some of that effect. I do love them bringing back Cloak and Dagger. I like how they interact with characters. They're very, very much so in the same point or same place. It's like we know where you where your heads are at. We know what you're going through. We have been through all of that. But as they're much younger, the uh, runaways can trust them a little bit more. And I like that we get to see more of that. There was an interaction there in the first volume between Cloak and Dagger and the runaways. Cloak and Dagger, of course, runaways themselves at one point. Uh, but yeah, they they run into the runaways. I think they're going to help them. They were they were trying to help them against the pride, and it turns out members of the pride showed up, and they kind of allude to this here. Uh, but members of the pride show up and actually wipe Cloak and Dagger's mind before they can do anything to help them out. Uh, so that's how Cloak kind of remembers the runaways and goes to them for help. Chris, Pusher Man. I mean, wow, yeah. <laughs> I I had to look that up on the old wiki here. Uh, so I, I just because I was like, I didn't know if this was somebody that had a history in Marvel yeah, or not. I'm assuming this is his only appearance, right? His appearance here is the first appearance that we get. And then he actually ends up dying in the pages of Runaways, I think, in issue like 25 or something. So he only lasts seven well, that's issues. That's something, but... I guess. <laughs> <laughs> but uh yeah this is the first time i ever saw this guy and of course yeah i was like does this guy have a history and no he does not <laughs> but uh so anyway push your man but all right chris uh, you, you got any thoughts on this uh, uh, other than the interaction with um the other superheroes, which I liked, uh, with uh, Spider Man specifically, and uh, with Molly, you know, knocking Wolverine for a loop. Oh yeah, uh, I thought that was pretty cool. It was cool to see, you know, the L.A. kids in the snow in a in a New York winter, but not a whole lot else to say about that. This was there's a lot of references in these issues to like the state of Marvel at the time, you know, mid two thousands. There's references to like, oh, the Avengers are back together. And if you were reading at the time, you kind of recognized the team members and stuff and what was going on in those books. And MGH, mutant growth hormone, yeah. Was kind of a big deal like in the X Men books and stuff. And and it kind of makes its way into these issues of runaways. But it's like the books stand on their own. You don't have to be reading any of that other. So that's and the way I think comics really should be done. We're like, it's not a big crossover, but if you see characters from other books in these in runaways, you know, you kind of get an idea of what the state of those books are going to be at that time, you know, in the continuity and stuff. Yeah. Uh, yeah and I exactly. like that a lot more than them shoehorning in like, well, if Captain America is going to grow be in runaways, let's just make it part of the crossover that we're doing or whatever. The runaways pretty much sit on its own through its entire run, which is unusual for like Marvel and DC. And it's one of the the good things about it yeah without branching out and it's necessary to know what happened here and what happened in this book and what happened in this book really the only time i'm lost uh reading these first 18 uh or what happens in this next issue that we get to where with issue 13 where things just something must have happened in between 12 and 13 in a different book i think because that's where molly ends up in the sewers i, I didn't and they kind of explain what happened but again that's the only time throughout this series that where i was kind of confused in regards to the continuity of things and uh now if i miss something you guys pointed out but uh, i again i was crazy yeah, I, I was in confused here. as well i don't know okay. if, if that was her just referencing an adventure that never got told or if that maybe that is is, is in a book somewhere okay Honestly, I think this has some of the best writing and the best jokes out of all of the issues of Volume 2. I love it. 
they see Spider-Man and Molly's like, you're, you already goes, yeah, I'm Batman. <laughs> and then when Molly throws Wolverine out of the church and he's like, all oh, it's like all the kids on the planet and that kid's got to be a mutant. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. That was another thing that you were mentioning there, Chris, there was, they were down to like the 100 and what? 87 mutants where uh, all, yeah. this was yeah, after the no more mutants. Yeah. Yeah. That was after uh Scarlet, was a Scarlet witch that did yeah, that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, but yeah, I, I mean, really the, the only big uh, thing that came out of there team wise, they have an adventure in New York. Uh, Nico uh, kisses chase it, chase, by the way, is, is not interested. He's still very much, uh, and I don't think we even brought this up yet, but Gertrude and chase are, are an item mm-hmm. uh, and have been, uh, and you know, they kind of set it up. Like there was the scene where chase and Nico were sitting on the bed and chase was like, you're a nine you know, a 9.5 when you smile or whatever, like flirting. And it's like, so it makes it even more of a surprise when she kisses him and he's like, Hey, no, I'm, I'm not interested or whatever. Like, yeah, it almost laid was kind of leading towards like, you know, if he had the opportunity, he would totally go for it. But then when, when the opportunity arises, he's quick to be in, be like, you know, no, I'm with Gertrude or whatever. Yeah. Very unlike the jock part of his character. And that's, right. that's what I think they're, you know, they're tr- trying to drive home here is that, yeah, he's, he's kind of this, you know, this, this jock and he, he seems like he's definitely not, he is, I think the least mature of the runaways. Yeah. And that is with probably t- taking Molly into consideration. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the other thing is, is that there's that point where I think Nico looks into the dying future Gertrude's memories and they see the Avengers getting killed by victorious. One of the things that stuck out and it probably stuck out to you guys as well is where Gertrude was, she was yelling at somebody. Uh, She might've been yelling at victorious. I don't know, but it's clear that at that time when she was leader of the Avengers, she is involved romantically with victorious or Victor Mancha. They they play off that tension, especially yeah. here in New York yeah, when they split up in groups. It. Yeah. Yep. So they they split they they play off that because they split off in groups and 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 Gert and Victor go off on their own group, and then of course Chase and Nico are are, are checking out the Pusher Man. So it, it it that's that teenage romance angle that they're going to play through here as as the issues unfold. So I think you can really understand where Nico's coming from. I mean, she was romantically linked to Alex, so she's still dealing with the betrayal of feeling like she fell in love with somebody who was going to kill her. Yeah. Uh, she had Carolina come after her, and she had to basically say, no, I'm straight. Mm-hmm. She's very, very torn about this whole thing, and I think she was looking for someone to embrace after all that. I, I honestly feel that Nico was partially almost Almost maybe even thinking, why couldn't I be gay so I could have gone with Carolina? She just wants a connection. She yeah. wants to feel that security she felt with Alex before he turned traitor. Again, I, I think that's a, a tribute to Brian K. Vaughn's writing. In, in my opinion, I don't. I. I. I you know, I don't go into I, I'm more of the Punisher guy, so I don't get into the whole romance angle of a lot of <laughs> comics. This feels like it's written pretty well, in my opinion. Uh, yeah, you know, it's the, got the, a real like teen drama feel to it, but like it's very accessible anyway. Like it's not something that feels like it's for for teenagers necessarily or not exactly exclusively for teenagers. Yeah. Dead Ringers, issue 13. Molly wakes up in the bottom of the sewer with a collar around her neck, among some other runaways, who are all under the watchful eye of a thief named Provost, who intends on using the children to steal for him. When the team is sent out to rob a bank, Molly comes up with a plan to relieve Provost of his wand, which is believed to be the source of his power. And when they break the wand, it releases them from the collars, also turning Provost into stone. Molly wishes for her newfound friends to join the Runaways, but they just want to get back to their own parents. The issue ends with Molly falling asleep on a bus bench, dreaming of her own family. All right, Dead Ringers, issue 13. So uh, this is the one I was talking about, where Molly wakes up at the bottom of the sewer. You know, she's got a collar around her neck, and she's uh, amongst a bunch of other kids that have collars around their neck, and they're serving this guy by the name of Provost, who sends them out to pretty much just rob places <laughs> and he's training them how to uh, train them to rob. So it's a one issue kind of, I wouldn't call it a throwaway, but I mean, it, it doesn't really add a whole lot to the 18 issue, 18 issue story arc in my opinion, but Chris, we'll, we'll switch it around here. Do you have anything to say about uh, dead ringers? I really liked this issue. Um, it is pretty much the only one I can remember 
from the run so far, all the way going back to the original volume one, that's just like a one-off, one-issue thing. And it's all Molly. I don't think any of the other characters even appear in the issue. And it's a good example of like, Alf- let me see his name, Alfona. Yeah. Of his art really, like it really feels like he took a leap in volume two from like the first volume, which I like his art in that as well. But like he, he gets a chance to draw, to like design all these young kids and they all look really have really unique looks to them. Uh, and of course, the uh, what's the bad guys? Uh, Provost. Yeah. Uh, with the the uh, scraggly goatee and the bald light bulb head. I just really like the art in this issue as well as the story. Again, another character that was strictly created for this volume. I Trust me, I went to the wiki to check it out. <laughs> I was like, this guy have a history? No, he does not. Yeah, he's got that weird like whip kind of deal. Like it yeah. has a hand on the end of it. And I just, he's a strange creation. He's definitely got that menacing tone about him, considering they live in the sewers. And this guy's got a bunch of kids, including two kids, of which he turned into stone. There was a Batman the Animated Series episode with a, a similar character who was like had a bunch of orphans that he had kind of taken and made like a little army of thieves out of that live in the sewers. I think it was Batman the Animated Series anyway. Um, OK, but well, no magic or, or, or sci fi elements related to that story. He was just a, an asshole. <laughs> Well, uh, Alexis, what do you think of uh, Dead Ringers here? Any any comments from you? I don't know. I, I, I do like it. I kind of like seeing the development of the individual characters and seeing that Molly, while the youngest, and she does have the most, you know, we were just talking about how Chase is probably the most immature, but Molly does have the most flaws being the youngest, and she doesn't seem to have the most control over her power. She tires out easily. She keeps having to fall asleep. She doesn't really know how to rein them in and save her energy. But I like that we see that she is still able to organize a plan, get these kids on her side, and fight back without the others coming to her aid. Good point. Yeah, it it kind of shows how she can kind of step up, and she doesn't have to rely on... I mean, she takes charge right away. She's like, I'm the best one here. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, OK, Molly, wait, wait a second now. But then, of course, it turns out, yeah, she is. And she's instituting what she's learned a lot by being a, a, a runaway and being around her teammates. I'll tell you right now, the saddest part of that whole issue is like near the end. I mean, after they defeat Provost, turn him into stone, you know, she's got all these other runaways. And she's like, come on, you know, you guys come with me. You guys can hang out with me. And they're like, no, we just kind of want to get back to our mom and dad. Yeah. And. Molly doesn't have one. She doesn't have a mom and dad anymore. And I think that's the roughest part of that whole issue is like her walking to that bus stop and asking that lady where she's where she could go. And then, of course, she's halfway between falling asleep until she finally crawls up there and falls unconscious. And then she dreams about her mom and dad. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, that is dreams kind of heartbreaking, It Uh, is, especially in when she does. She wasn't even there to know you know, what her parents did in the ceremony. And I guess she did interact with them at the very end uh, when the Graborum show up at the end of volume one or whatever. But it seems like she was probably maybe hoping the whole time that it was going to be resolved, that her parents were really actually okay mm-hmm. you know, until the end. And I think that probably hit her harder than anybody else. Yeah. Yeah. It was rough. At the end of that was rough. Parental Guidance, Issues 14 through 18. In these issues, Victor learns of Alex's betrayal of the Runaways, and perhaps why they are so untrusting of having him among the group. We also learn about the origin of the mysterious group that has been planning to act against the Runaways. It appears there was a pack of online RPG players who used to play with Alex Wilder, and they find instructions on how to bring him back by reaching back in time and pulling him forward just before he dies. Unfortunately, the spell backfires, and they bring in Alex's dad, Jeffrey, to the present, one of the members of the Pride. As Alex's friends explain what had happened recently with the Pride and how they believed Alex's death was not his fault, Jeffrey makes plans to bring the Pride back by making a sacrifice to the Elder Gods called the Jaborum for the return of his wife and child. Jeffrey then convinces Alex's friends to kidnap Molly under the guise of trying to rescue her from the runaways. During all of this, Carolina and Zavin return, explaining their marriage ceremony only resulted in more war, so they left and came back to Earth. When the fight to stop Molly from being sacrificed goes down, the runaways are able to free Molly, but at a price. As Gert attempts to save Chase, Jeffrey is able to kill Gert. The runaways defeat Jeffrey, sending him home to his own time, wiping out his memories. 
After losing his love, Gert, Chase takes off with Old Lace and leaves the Runaways at the end of the issue. So parental guidance, five issues, 14 through 18 here. Alexis, we'll start with you here. Firstly, I love that they give Jeffrey Waller all this old timey slang from when his character would have been that. It's so <laughs> stupid, but it's a really nice touch. You know, it's like, yeah, it's like you address me as Jeffrey. Or it's like you address me as Drif- Jeffrey or Mr. Wilder dig. Like show you <laughs> yeah. how we used to sell scores back in 85. And he's dressed like freaking Miami Vice. Yep. Oh, my God. I oh, love yeah. it. Man, well, when you first read it, Chris, were you initially expecting Alex to have come back somehow or survived? And then when they do the spell, were you expecting Alex to be there? And were you completely surprised when you find out it's Jeffrey? Um, well, I can't go back to what I thought 12 years ago or whatever. But when I was reading it earlier today, I was like, I don't remember Alex ever coming back. <laughs> <laughs> so you done uh, forgot. <laughs> yeah, and and bringing him back really doesn't feel like something that Vaughn would do. I mean, he did bring, I guess, the other characters. Again, the last thing I've read uh, on my reread is when, when his dad pops up in the middle of that ceremony or whatever. Yep. Uh, the younger version. But yeah, it was it was a surprise, and uh, I thought it was a pretty unique twist for, for him to throw in there. Like, um, I was a little, like thought it took a pretty big leap of logic to assume these you know yes. rpg guys were just like hey <laughs> instead of going to the authorities let's just partake in these magical ceremonies <laughs> but it were it worked it, it, it's a comic book so i guess it's fine believe it or not that, that's exactly what a lot of people picked up on when i saw some of the people who were talking about these specific issues online they were like uh so <laughs> this is no i don't think so and i i felt the same way i was like okay these these people are going to get together and uh, they're going to know what well, granted they had one smart guy that was among them that was able to like decode whatever that thing was i can't remember what the um uh, the codex or whatever they had there that the pride it, it had some kind of a ring it was like a decoder ring of some sort but anyway he figured it out but then he ends up dying during the ceremony and he was probably the smartest one of them all and then the rest of them were just i, I yeah i i couldn't see them as a, va- a valid even potential threat but jeffrey that's a different thing i mean i i understood jeffrey as a threat for sure to the runaways Carolina and Zavin are back there, Alexis. They came back from the depths of space. Apparently the wedding, I assume, has been ruined. I mean, we're what what'd you think here? You said you felt you saw this coming way before it actually happened, right? I knew that Carolina wasn't going to be gone for too long. I knew that they were building her up to come back. I got asked though, the wedding dress is cute, but what the hell is that headdress she's wearing? <laughs> it, 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 it's like I don't know what it is. It it looks like she took three breastplates and just stuck them on her head. <laughs> Put them on her head. <laughs> Okay, so everything was going fine up until something happened at the wedding, and then there was all-out war happened again. So they're just like, okay, screw this, we're out. And they're like, they decide to come back to Earth. For me, I was like, okay, well, you know, this was, I guess, a way of bringing Zavin into the into the fold uh, as a runaway. And of course, you know, we in this issue at issue eight, or the, we in this story arc at issue eighteen, I could just imagine what love triangles uh, are, are just await the next few issues with Zavin being present and Nico being present and Carolina being present. I mean, it's just going to be. I can imagine it's going to be off the charts, like, you know, Aaron Spelling stuff going on here. Beverly Hills 90210 stuff or something. But so uh, Alexis, Gert's death happens at the very end of this. Did it, uh, did it produce some feelings? Actually, it really did. I did not anticipate that Gert was going to be the I, I didn't really know which one was going to die, but I didn't think it was going to be Gert. Yeah. It was really hard. And not to mention, I hate to say, but I think I identify, I think a lot of readers identify with Gert and we like her the most. She's, they, they built, they really write her and describe her as she's more plain look. She's not as attractive as Nico or Caroline. She's obviously not as skinny. She's a little more dumb. She's a little more tomboyish. The fact that she was with Chase, who we've seen as yeah, the dumbass jock, but who fell in love with her. And when given an option to go with a hotter girl, he said, no, I love Gert and I want to be with her. I think it's something that a lot of people really want to see them seeing themselves. They want to, you know, know what that's like. 
Yeah. It's also a way of kind of symbolizing what happened at the very beginning of this series will not come to pass for sure. So Mm -hmm. again, showing that because Gert's dying now, uh, future Gert's not going to be around. So can Victor Mancha be changed? You know, the future can be changed. Gert's death there, Chris, what'd you think? Seems like at one point, it gets down to where it's just like Chase and Molly um, oh, of the, of the Runaways, right? I I can't really remember, but um, I know after Gertrude dies, uh, Chase pretty much takes over um, uh, Old Lace, yeah. and uh, Old Lace becomes kind of Chase's uh, uh, guardian or familiar, whatever you want to call him. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's at the very end of uh, issue eighteen. Uh, Chase is actually away. He's he's walked away from the runaway. Does he leave I, the team? Okay, I can, yeah, I, he. I couldn't remember exactly what was going on. I couldn't remember. Uh, yeah, at least at that point, he's he's separated himself with Old Lace away from the team. So obviously, he's taken Gert's death really hard. He's off to do his own thing. So. I'm just going to add, it has nothing to do with Gert's death, but I always love when somebody finds a way to write in the Computer War 10 issues reference. <laughs> <That's awesome. laughs> it's a scene where uh, Chase, uh, Victor's talking in his sleep and Chase goes to wake him up and Chase, or Victor's apparently sleeping naked. Oh, yes. And, yeah, and Chase's like, ah, male nudity, dude, why, it's like, why are you sleeping naked? At least the Computer War 10 issues. And I dropped the book. I was laughing so hard. Like, I love when anyone can find an excuse to throw reference to that that was awesome nice all right well let's get our overall thoughts here i don't think there's anything uh else left to say here i mean i'll start out here i i personally again i really enjoy brian k vaughn's writing uh 18 issues oh my gosh mark radlich and then he ducks out of the podcast (laughs) you know he's like (laughs) I mean, come on. But uh, it was not hard to get through these issues. It's definitely not, you know, mid 90s splash page esque (laughs) stuff going on here. There's definitely some great writing going on by Brian Brian K. Vaughn, but I was able to read it completely and understand what was going on and have no problem punching all 18 issues in. I think I did all 18 in in one day if i if if not i split it up so that's you know that's that's some very good reading there especially if it keeps you interested and i i, I was definitely interested in this story i really enjoyed myself had a good time this is the first uh, time you read it this is the first time i read volume i think i read volume 2 now here's the thing i remember going to the library they had the digest issues you're talking about those those digests yeah. they had them and i picked one up and i think i might have read i read the issues that had the uh, had provost in them so the dead ringer storyline mm. that fell in there now i don't know which digest that was but i know i was being dropped into the middle of things i knew the whole victor mancha thing was was going on as well but it, I only read that one digest because I couldn't find the others to show up there at the library. So, yeah, this is the first time I've read all 18 issues straight front to back. And I, you know, I would have definitely remembered the be- very beginning of this, the very beginning of this series when when Gert comes back in time, because usually that's something that's going to grab my attention immediately and want me to go and seek out trying to figure out <laughs> re- what's going to happen with the rest of the story. But uh, but yeah, I had a good time reading it, and uh, hopefully, you know, this is something we're going to revisit in the future. I know, just uh, like I said, Runaway season two is in the middle of. Well, it's it's been on Hulu for I think about a month now. We're going to be covering. We're going to be doing a TV party tonight on it here. I think Tuesday, so it'd be the day after this show airs. Me and, and and see, this is a show that I can watch with my daughter. So, uh, you know, there is some risque stuff, but we, we she's uh, 13 going on 14 and she's able to kind of, you know, we, we, this is something I feel she can handle. Uh, and so me and the wife and the daughter have been watching this straight through and we've, we've been enjoying it. So it was fun to kind of tell her some of the stuff that's happened in the book uh, along with the show as well. But, uh, all right. So, Alexis, final thoughts on eight, uh, volume two, issues one through 18 of Runaway. You know, one of the things I really love about this series is that in the past when we've read comics and there's been a teenager or a young child character, they've been written, they're usually written horribly cliche. They're, they're the annoyance. They're the naive one. They're the one, you know, they're, they're the jubilees. They're there to spout catchphrases <laughs> and get kidnapped. But I love the runaways because you, 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 there's at least one character in there that you know, you can identify with. We we're not teenagers, but we've all been teenagers. Yep. We, we didn't understand where these kids 
kids are coming from. We've been not exactly in a situation, but we know what it's like. I mean, I really like that these characters are identifiable. They're relatable. If we could have seen ourselves in that exact same situation if we were still that age. The whole, you know, don't trust grownups. Oh, my God. How many of us went through that? How many yeah. of us are still going through that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Oh, yeah. And that's and that's one of the things I really like this book. I actually gave the first two volumes of Runaways to my um, my assistant's daughter when she turned 13. Oh, that really? I, I said, I think this is a series you're really going to like. I also gave a copy of volume one to my cousin when she turned 12. Did you get any feedback from them? Did they say they enjoyed it or? Uh, the My cousin really liked it. My assistant's daughter, unfortunately, is a manga nut. So I kind of had to say, well, you stop reading manga and read real comics. <laughs> <laughs> I probably uh, just alienated half of our audience. So. Yeah, boom, they all dropped off. Well, at least they waited this long. A listen's a listen. <laughs> <laughs> nothing against manga readers. I have nothing against manga readers. I swear to God. <laughs> uh, we 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 actually had the chance to cover some manga on here way back in the day with Robert Cooper, and our, uh, we read a we read a story called Vinland Saga. And I'll tell you right now, I it was probably one of the most intense things that I've read quite a while uh so it, it definitely has its place and there's there's certainly some great stories out there that are being told chris armstrong issues one through whatever you got to read to i've always wanted to go back and reread runaways because as it was even though i wasn't reading the single issues that they were coming out i was reading it pretty consistently in the in, during its original run and it was consistently one of the best books marvel was putting out um especially during the Bron K. Vaughn era of Runaways. Uh, so I've always kind of wanted to go back and reread it, and this was a good opportunity to do so. One thing I haven't mentioned throughout, and, and I'll, some of this may have been more in Volume 1, but I think in Volume 2 as well, there are a lot of like pop culture references that do kind of date it, like references to Joss Whedon's Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Uh, it, some of the references even, like they referenced Judge Ito at one point, and... That would have been like 10 years before wow. it came out. But like, there's a lot of stuff, uh, which that's because, you know, Vaughn, I think, is he knows his audience and yeah. people like that stuff. Now, kids now may not understand some of that stuff, but it doesn't detract from it or anything. It was something that was really noticeable as I was rereading these, like a lot of references to TV shows, movies, uh, you know, what we would call content, different content uh, that was popular mm -hmm. in the mid 2000s got dropped in there, uh, which is, I kind of appreciate because it kind of puts me back in that mode of, of when these books were coming out. Yeah. And, and I mean, said, like you said, really breezy read. Like I read like probably about 200 pages today trying to, to catch up. I didn't make it, but, <laughs> but like, it's a, it's a, it's not like super, um, dense. Right. I mean, it's, and it's not like too breezy to where it, it doesn't feel like you're getting anything out of it, but it is a really good read. It really kind of flies by when you get into it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, speaking of the, I sent you guys the message there online of, you know, Vaughn writing in his reference to Lost on uh, Victor's, <laughs> yeah. Victor's yeah. message, uh, which was great. He's like, oh, I'm, I'm probably in the middle of Lost. So if it's Wednesday, you know, you will have to catch me sometime <laughs> later. I was like, oh, that's great. All right. Very good. Well, all right. Well, I guess this uh, right here brings our coverage of Runaways of Volume 2, Issues 1 through 18 to a close. Let's go ahead. We'll get into plugs and we will get out of here. Alexis hit us with what? What's going on? Uh, what is Honeysuckle Rose Creations getting into right now? Well, like I said earlier, we are currently on break from the convention circuit. There's not a lot of shows that are going on in this part of the country in January and February, and we're trying to cut our travel costs down a little bit. So at the moment, we are currently doing restock. We're, we're working on a bunch of uh, brand new products. I just put the final touches on new Spider-Verse charm bracelets, a new line of Darkwing duck pieces. Had a Ooh. lot of them. Oh, I mean, yeah. Nice. And we're adding a bunch of new pieces onto our online stores as soon as I get a little decent lighting. I use all natural light for my photo for my product photography. I don't use flash kits or anything. And we've had about a solid week of straight cloud coverage here in Kansas City. So it's like I need some sun. <laughs> I need some vitamin D regardless. So <laughs> hopefully we'll be getting some new products online uh, very soon. So keep an eye out for us. You can find Honeysuckle Roast Creations on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. And we have our stores on Etsy and Handmade at Amazon. All right. Very good. Chris Armstrong, what would you like to plug here, sir? 
Uh, not a whole lot. There's uh, my Twitter feeds at BrodyMan34, and I've <clears throat> had some stuff on the UnspokenDeadCade.com, which is a '90s uh, '90s appreciation, com- '90s comic book uh, appreciation site. And if you check that out, I'll probably have something new up there pretty soon. Okay, very good. I want to thank Alexis Hanna for coming on here. I want to thank Chris Armstrong for coming on here. I am Jesse Starcher. We're going to catch you next week. Have a good one. Uh, bye bye. Thank you all for joining us. Make sure to give that Rattlelich in Broadcasting Facebook page a like to stay up on top of all the great podcasts we have to offer. We are at home on Spreaker, but you can also find us on iTunes, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio, and recently we have hit the air on Spotify. Find your favorite podcast platform and type in R-A-D-U-L-I-C-H to subscribe for some great content. If you enjoyed this show, please feel free to share and spread the word. And as always, we appreciate any feedback and look forward to entertaining you again soon. I'm Jay Farner, CEO of Quicken Loans, America's premier home purchase lender. We've created a new way to protect you from unpredictable interest rates. Our exclusive Rate Shield approval. First, we lock your interest rate for up to 90 days. Then, if rates go up, your rate stays locked. But if rates go down, your rate drops. Either way, you win. Call us today at 800 Quicken or go to rocketmortgage.com. Rate Shield approval only valid on certain 30 year fixed rate loans. Call for cost information and conditions. Equal housing lender. License in all 50 states. NMLS number 3030. Additional conditions or exclusions may apply. In today's cyber world, the wolves are attacking. Is your company safe? HP Enterprise printers are built to help keep your company protected with layers of security that can stop the wolves in their tracks. Upgrade to HP Enterprise printers and keep the wolves out of your neck of the woods. Nothing is safe if your office isn't HP Secure. HP Business Printing, the world's most secure printers. See the wolf and HP in action. Visit hp.com forward slash the wolf.